Hello, I'm Ben Tumen, and welcome to Skipped History. Today's story is about the Pledge of Allegiance. I read about it in One Nation Under God by Kevin Cruz. In October 1892, a patriotic Baptist minister named Francis Bellamy proposed that every schoolhouse in the nation lead students through a celebration of the American flag. He wrote a salute reading, I pledge allegiance to my flag and to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. In the following years, this pledge spread around the country, although it did undergo some revisions. In 1924, my flag became the flag of the United States. In 1925, this phrase became the flag of the United States of America. And in 1926, just to be extra clear, this phrase became the flag of the United States of America, this here blobby area that broke off from Pangaea 175 million years ago. But through all these revisions, the Pledge of Allegiance never mentioned God. That changed in 1954, timing that coincided with corporate executives' attempts to roll back the New Deal. Coincidence? I think not. To see what I mean, let's first chat about FDR. As part of the New Deal, his administration implemented banking reform, set maximum hours and minimum wages for workers, and raised taxes on the country's wealthiest people. To sell this legislation to the public, FDR made heavy use of religious rhetoric. According to one biographer, probably no American politician has delivered more speeches that were effectively sermons rather than statements of policy, except, of course, for Ted Cruz. Do you like green eggs and ham? Consequently, corporate executives who didn't like FDR's pro-worker reforms had a lot of trouble building opposition to the New Deal. But then a pro-business minister named James Fifield offered them a chance to beat FDR at his own religious game. Originally from Chicago, Fifield led the elite First Congregational Church in LA. From his pulpit, he railed against FDR, stating that every Christian should oppose the totalitarian trends of the New Deal. In 1939, he even took out a full-page ad in the LA Times in defense of corporate America, writing that goodness and Christian ideals run proportionately high among businessmen. Of note, First Congregational's pews were filled with corporate executives like Harry Chandler, the conservative publisher of the LA Times. And thanks to the church's custom design collections plate, Fifield enjoyed a lifestyle similar to those of the millionaires he ministered to, earning the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars per year and living in a mansion that originally housed an oil tycoon. Sure, Fifield conceded, during the Great Depression, it was quite a shock to a lot of people to see a minister driving around in a good car with a chauffeur, but he and his wife insisted they were small town folks, riding in a glitzy limo, took a chauffeured car all around LA. As the 1940s wore on, Fifield engineered a campaign to show people that, contrary to what FDR said, the glorification of the state is really a denial of God. With donations from executives at General Motors, DuPont, Chrysler, Gulf Oil, Standard Oil, Sun Oil, Republic Steel, Colgate, Palmolive, and more, Fifield developed a grassroots network of thousands of ministers preaching Christian libertarianism. To inform their sermons, Fifield relied on an organization called Spiritual Mobilization, which distributed copies of his speeches, produced a national radio show that warned about the dangers of creeping socialism, and published a magazine that included articles like a parable about a group of seagulls who let themselves be fed by shrimp boats and soon forgot how to care for themselves. The moral of the story? Hell hath no fury like a libertarian scorned by a gull who ate all their shrimp. Fifield's efforts proved effective. After remaining stable throughout the first part of the 20th century, rates of church going in the U.S. spiked in the 1940s and 50s, thanks in large part to the grassroots activity of organizations like Spiritual Mobilization. In fact, Spiritual Mobilization, which I'm now just going to call SPERMO, organized tens of thousands of sermons in 1951 dedicated to the theme of freedom under God, successfully popularizing the phrase. However, SPERMO's plan soon encountered an unexpected problem the 1952 election of Republican Dwight Eisenhower. On one hand, Ike was quite spiritual. He referred to himself as the most intensely religious person I know, and in his acceptance speech at the Republican National Convention, declared his campaign to be a great crusade for freedom in America and for freedom in the world. Of course, as we've explored once or twice or thrice, that wasn't exactly the case. Encouraged by Ike's seeming dedication to Christianity, conservative organizations like the pro-business, very religious Freedoms Foundation organized a massive Get Out the Vote campaign in 1952, helping guide Ike to a landslide victory. On the other hand, after his election, it became clear that Ike didn't intend to herd the faithful into the waiting arms of the conservative movement. Rather, he wanted to use a vague conception of God to unify the country. Democracy, he believed, doesn't work unless it's founded in a deeply felt religious faith, 
and I don't care what it is. So, contrary to Christian libertarians' hopes, Ike used the heightened spirituality in the U.S. that people like Fifield had helped build not to tear down the state, but to enlarge it. His administration expanded social security, kept tax rates high, and beefed up funding for education, all as part of a spiritual revival that Ike preached the U.S. needed. Disappointed conservatives, their efforts backfiring, increasingly viewed Ike's policies as a watered-down extension of FDRs, or what Senator Barry Goldwater called a dime store New Deal. A Sunday School New Deal might have been more accurate, because Ike made religion an indelible part of lawmakers' and citizens' everyday lives. He transformed the National Prayer Breakfast into an annual tradition for presidents, oversaw the addition of In God We Trust to stamps, and notably attended a sermon by a Scottish minister who insisted that the phrase under God be added to the Pledge of Allegiance. Why? Because apart from the mention of the phrase United States of America, this could be the pledge of any republic. So in June 1954, Ike signed a bill into law that amended the Pledge of Allegiance to read, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Although I've always preferred the extra specific extended version, which reads, I pledge allegiance to my flag, that wispy piece of cloth that helps you determine how windy it is, and to the republic for which it stands, or sometimes droops when it's not windy at all, one nation under God, that being who we're pretty sure lives in the clouds, hard to tell, I digress, let's be real, I could go on and on and on and on. In sum, the U.S. became suffused with religion in large part thanks to the efforts of Christian libertarians who hoped that spiritual arguments would convince U.S. citizens to oppose business regulations and big government. If you ever pledged allegiance to a nation under God, you have them to thank. But as we've also seen, Dwight Eisenhower unexpectedly derailed conservatives' plans. In the 1970s, a memo by a Supreme Court justice would set them back on track. Tune in next time to learn more about that bit of skipped history.